Kong here coming at you live with our creating a educational, enriching, and um, engaging preschool dance curriculum. So if you are joining me, please again let me know your name, where you're located, if you have a dance studio, what dance studio you're with. So before I start, today I'm talking about how you can create an educational, engaging, and enriching uh, preschool dance curriculum. And so I really, before I get into it, I want to talk about why this is important and why you should consider having a really, um, a really quality preschool program. I sort of feel like preschool and the younger ages are really the backbone of your studio because when they're younger, they've never been exposed to dance. And if you can give them that nurturing, engaging environment right away and just get them to fall in love with dance, then hopefully I would think that you would have a dancer for life at your studio. So we kind of want to get them hooked in and in love with dance at a young age and then hopefully they love your studio and they keep coming back year after year and dancing with with you and not leaving to go dance with someone else so I do feel like this is really important um, a little bit about me and my background so along with dance to learn my original business that I started uh, was dance exploration and I started that company 11 years ago um, we have rebranded in that 11 years and today we go by Exploration Kids Enrichment and today we're more than just dance. Today we offer dance, yoga, cheerleading, tumbling. So we offer a whole wide variety of performing arts uh, enrichment and we provide these to our local schools. Um, now going back in time when I first started Dance Exploration, 11 years ago, I didn't really have a curriculum or anything in place. I just knew that I wanted to teach dance. And so I just started opening the phone book back when phone books were popular. And I called the first, you know, school on the list of phone books and asked them if they wanted a dance program. And they said, you know what? Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. Um, and so that was sort of how I started. So I didn't really have a business background or anything like that. I just knew I wanted to be involved in dance and teaching dance and all of that good stuff. Um, so I just sort of started a business. <laughs> um, so when I got to the point of, and this was maybe six months in, I had sort of expanded to the point where I couldn't teach all of the classes anymore. I don't think I realized how popular this business model was until I started the business. Um, but at that point, I sort of needed to hire more instructors. So I uh, just put an ad on Craigslist and had about 15 applications come in. And I didn't really, you know, I had them audition. And I realized sort of quickly into this process that people had different ideas of, you know, maybe my idea of what a ballet class is or what a hip hop class is. I even had a random call. We had booked, I think it was a musical theater class and the school called me really confused and said my instructor was teaching like clay modeling or something, which has nothing to do with musical theater. So um, it was sort of at that point early on that I knew I need a curriculum and I need to train all of my teachers on it so that I can actually have a brand and a name behind my program. And so it was sort of at that point that Dance to Learn was born and it's been in development for the past 10 years. So, and I sort of feel like with curriculum, you're always gonna be adding to it, changing it, improving it, creating new lesson plans, new ideas. It's sort of a never ending creation process, which I personally love um, because that's just sort of my where my talent lies. I love creating and using my imagination and coming up with fun, unique ideas. But if you're a dance teacher or studio owner and you don't have a curriculum yet, I think number one, it's really going to set your studio apart and your brand apart because once you have that curriculum, you can say, 
I'm the only dance studio that has the dance to learn curriculum and then you can sort of explain what is this curriculum you know or whatever you name uh, happen to name your curriculum um, so it's just a really great way to improve your brand and so basically what started happening because we reach out to preschools elementary schools and middle schools is we would have kids you know in a preschool program and they would graduate from preschool and be ready for elementary school and dance exploration would be in both schools and parents would instantly go that's the same program that my kid just did in preschool and they would recognize that you know whether it was the class flow or the content whatever it was they just instantly recognized it as that's already the program that we did we liked that we're going to continue signing up and keeping our kid in that program at uh, their new schools. Um, another thing that I noticed when I created the curriculum and I started training my instructors on it was that they got more confident. Um, I would do, I can't even tell you how many auditions I did with dance teachers where they'd come in, they'd teach about 15 minutes of a 45 minute audition and then look at me and say, I don't know what else to teach. Um, and, you know, so once I really laid out a curriculum for them, like what does a class look like? How do we fill out this 45 minutes? How do we make it the most productive? That's really, you know, when they were like, oh, okay, I do have the knowledge and the skills to teach 45 minutes. And I sort of gave them ideas on this is what you can do if you run out of an idea, you know, maybe you have five minutes left and you have no idea what else to do for those last five minutes. Um, but when you have confident teachers, your parents are gonna be more confident in you and your studio. So that's gonna be uh, really important for you as well. So all of these are really um, great reasons, obviously, to start developing your own curriculum. Uh, you can also, one thing that today I'm talking more about creative dance. So the, this is like the first after our toddler program, which is like mommy and me type stuff. The next level is creative dance. And uh, so that's really what I'm focusing on today. But we have, you know, pre ballet, hip hop, we have a whole, a whole curriculum of dance styles. But when you set out your curriculum and you start, you know, this is what a classical looks like. This is what our themes are, this is what we're teaching. Once you start setting that up, then you're gonna notice you have consistency and you have a progressive program. So you'll know and your teachers will know, my students aren't ready for pre-ballet until they can do these basic skills. And maybe those basic skills are, you know, plies, balance on one leg for five seconds, gallops, do they have their skips yet? Like you can start looking at some of these skills and determining are they ready for that next class. So you're gonna start building a progressive program and there's gonna be less confusion on who's ready to move on. Uh, plus, ideally, in a perfect world, when you have a curriculum, you can hire 10 different preschool teachers, have five preschool classes happening at one time and all of the kids are learning the same thing and you're not gonna have those issues of parents, you know, I wanna be in Miss so-and-so's class because we like her better. Everyone's gonna be consistent teaching the same thing. Um, and it's just gonna make your program appear to be a lot more uh, put together. And um, I think parents are gonna have more confidence in you and your studio than a dance studio who doesn't really have a set curriculum for for their school. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so what I'm going to be going over today in how to create this educational engaging preschool curriculum, I'm really going to be going over the what. So and what that means is I'm going to be really going over the content of what I've included in my curriculum, which is the dance to learn curriculum. Um, and not really, I might touch a little bit on the how, but I feel like teaching preschoolers is, it's not just, you can have an amazing curriculum and all of these great lesson plans and ideas, but if you don't know how to actually teach that age group and how to keep them engaged and how to get them to listen and how to keep them focused, then you kind of have, you know, you just have one piece of the pie. So preschool dance and preschool 
programs and all of this stuff, it's more than just the what. You really need to have teachers who know how to keep that group engaged. I, I would much rather teach a class of preschoolers than teenagers. Preschoolers are just, they're fun. I mean, I can be as silly and goofy as I want, and uh, with teenagers I have to be a little more strict. Uh, and I don't like feeling like I'm a super strict like <laughs> drill sergeant, but sometimes that's how I feel with some older kids, uh, the teenagers. So um, I really love teaching the younger kids. So I think it's just really finding those individuals that have that personality and can really engage and connect with that age group. But that's a whole, I could talk about um, how to teach preschoolers for another, that could be like a three hour Facebook Live in and of itself. Um, so I'm not going to touch too much on that today. Today I'm really focused on the content and what goes into your curriculum. Um, so other things that are the how side of things, these would be things like your routines, transitions, classroom management. I might touch on some of that stuff a little bit today, but really today the main focus is going to be that what. So what are we putting in to our curriculum and how do we make it work? All right, so before you can really start creating a preschool dance curriculum, you do have to do a little bit of research. Um, you guys can let me know in the comments if you've had a similar sort of start to teaching dance, but I think for a lot of us dance teachers, and especially for me, so I started out you know, learning dance and participating in dance as a child, and I grew up doing competitions and then I really got hit by the ballet bug and I left the competition world and enrolled in two really prestigious uh, pre-professional ballet programs. Um, one through Youth Ballet Colorado, which is now Colorado Conservatory of Dance. And then eventually I went into the Academy of Colorado Ballet. And then from there, um, I sort of, that's when I broke into teaching. So I didn't go to college. I didn't, you know, study how to become a teacher. I just tried to apply stuff that I sort of picked up from my instructors throughout the years to apply to my preschool age classes. So, um, and I think a lot of teachers may have that same experience where we don't really go to college because we wanna be professional dancers or whatever and this is really where our passion is. So I did uh, perform professionally for seven years in a professional ballet company here. Um, while teaching. So that was sort of my career path. Um, and when I first started teaching preschoolers, I mean, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really know what I was doing. I just thought, okay, I'll do ballerina princess theme. And I, you know, I remember some of my first preschool classes. It was just sort of chaotic. I had kids. It, <laughs> it was, it was an experience. Um, so I definitely didn't really understand um, how to get them to focus, how to get them to listen, how to get them to wait turns, how to do transitions. I mean, I'd be playing with my music and I'd turn around and they would be Wah! running all over the room like crazy. And so I didn't always, you know, have a natural ability to teach this age. It's only through years of research and watching other teachers and uh, things like that, that I've really gotten a handle on this age group and how to get them, how to inspire them, I should say, to focus and listen and do all of those things that are important. But one thing that you do wanna research that's really important before you start creating a curriculum or even if maybe you're not, you don't wanna create your own curriculum, but maybe you want to, you know, invest in a curriculum like Dance to Learn or Discover Dance or IntelliDance and the other curriculums that are out there. Um, you really want to understand the age of your kids and their development and where they are in their learning. Because if you don't understand who they are and what they should, like textbook development should be able to do, until you understand that, you're not going to be able to really focus on what needs to go into that curriculum. So, and I can give you a couple uh, quick examples. So one example 
I really knew teachers who had done the research when they started coming in and auditioning for me in my program because I would have teachers teaching skills that, you know, as somebody who's grown up and danced for years and now you're ready to be a teacher, for you, these dance moves are, these are things you do every day and maybe you don't remember how you learned and how you progressed into doing these more advanced moves. Um, but one example would be a grand plie. So I've had a ton of dancers come in and audition and one of the first things they do, they're doing plies and then they want the kids to do a grand plie and the kids are three. So one thing that I know about preschool age kids based on my childhood development uh, research is that they can balance for about one second for how old they are. So if they're three, they can balance for about three seconds. How many seconds does it take to do a grand plie? One, two, three, four, maybe eight seconds, right? It's beyond their ability. Can we get them there? Absolutely, that's our job as dance teachers. But um, that's just one of the one of the examples that I can think of where I really know if a dance teacher can understand their age group that they're teaching based on the skills that they're teaching the kiddos. So one thing that I do, and this might be controversial for dance teachers, but um, I do not introduce a ballet bar in any of my creative dance classes. Um, my creative dance is for ages three to five. We never do anything at a ballet bar. Number one, it's super distracting. I feel like I'm spending 20 minutes just saying yeah, how to stand at the bar and that's half my class. Um, so I just save myself the hassle of that. But the other thing that I know with this age group is when they first come in and they're three, they can balance for three seconds, theoretically. Textbook, that's what they should be able to do. Is that every child? No, they're all gonna be a little different but textbook says they can balance for about three seconds on their own. So I wanna, by the time they leave creative dance and they're ready for the next level, I wanna push that. I want them to be able to balance for six or seven seconds by the time they're five. That's sort of my job as the dance teacher to say, this is where you're coming, this is how you're coming to me. You know, you're fresh, you've never had dance before, so can I get you to this point by teaching certain skills a certain way. So I just don't include a ballet bar and I let them learn how to balance on their own two feet um, for their first couple years of dance. And then I don't introduce the ballet bar until pre-ballet, which is um, five, age five to seven. So, um, and we do have some five-year-olds that need a little bit longer because again, every child is a little different in their, uh, in their development. So another thing, and this is more of a how, uh, how to teach dance, I also recognize that this age group, the three, fours, and fives, they love mimicking and they love sort of copycat. I'm sure you've heard the phrase monkey see, monkey do. This is really <laughs> what they're good at. So they really like mimicking. So there's only one part in my class flow where I'm demonstrating anything, and that's when we do our obstacle course. The rest of the class, we stand up, I play the music, and they're just copying me the whole time and I'm sort of talking them through the process. This way, I know I can keep them engaged and I can keep them focused the whole time. And that's the same way I approach choreography. It's always, we're gonna play a game of copy Miss Jessica. I just play the music. I don't try to stop and sit there and explain anything because the second I do, they're just, they're gone. I'm gonna lose them and I'm, and I know that. So I just try to keep the class moving um, on, on what, we're, what we're trying to learn, what we're trying to do. So that's just a little bit of some how um, to teach this age group. And I go into, I can do a whole other um, live video on that because there's so much that goes into teaching this age group. Um, cool, so now I'm really gonna get into the components of our curriculum. Um, hopefully this inspires you to go out there and maybe create your own curriculum and uh, really start to brand your program and things like that. So when I, the thing that 
that helps me the most. So Dance to Learn is a theme-based curriculum. So everything we do is based on 12 monthly themes. And when I have a theme, I can really hone in and focus on everything else that gets thrown in from what concepts are we gonna teach to what activities are we gonna do? And then I have my lesson plans that I teach throughout the program. So one thing about themes and one thing that I avoid in the 12 monthly themes is I avoid anything religious holidays. So we don't do Christmas, we don't do Easter, we don't do any of that stuff. A big thing for me in my program especially is because we're an after school program, we teach in so many Jewish schools, in so many Catholic schools, in so many, you know, non-denominational schools. So we just try to not do if I made my entire program focused on religious holidays, then I would not have half the schools that I'm able to work with because um, they not everybody celebrates Christmas and Easter. So um, I avoid that and everything is really more seasonal uh, based on, you know, January it's cold, at least here in Colorado it's cold. So we do like cold based Arctic frozen themes and stuff like that. So every theme, um, I'll go through all 12 of them with you. Um, so January, I pick two themes. I also try to pick themes that are gender sort of neutral. I don't, I don't really do anything princess. Um, like we have a summer camp that's all princess, uh, but then we also have a summer camp that's all superhero. So that's a little bit different, but normally everything is just super gender neutral. So. Um, we're not isolating anybody because we have so many boys that participate in our creative dance classes because um, they don't tend to do like our, I've never had any boys in our ballet tap and I've never had any boys in our pre-ballet, which is sad, but they do creative dance and they kind of do like a teddy bear hip hop. They'll move into, into that style. Um, so January, I pick from two themes. Um, if I have more boys in my group, I'll do an Arctic Blast theme, and this is really focused on Arctic animals, maybe penguins, polar bears, narwhals, Arctic foxes, all of those types of things. Um, and then my second option is if I do have a girl heavy class, Frozen is still like, I mean, how long? Has Frozen been out now there's another Frozen so Frozen is just kind of the way to go um, so if I have a ton of girls we'll do Dance to Frozen for the entire month of January and it's all Anna, Elsa, Sven, Olaf and they eat it up so those are my two themes that I pick for January um, February we do Dance Friends are the best friends and that month is a lot of um, learning how to dance with a partner in different relationships, like holding hands facing a partner, maybe holding one hand and the other hand dances, um, learning how to dance in circles, following the leader. So it's a lot of social uh, development during the month of February. And, and we do some, like we'll do conversation hearts and it's not, we're not trying to push Valentine's Day, but like we'll have different things, you know, dance with a friend, you know, face, face a friend in chasse across the floor or whatever. And we put different dance moves on the conversation hearts. Um, we also use teddy bears that month as a prop. So our teddy bear will be our friend as well. Um, March is our Dance Me a Story month. And so this is a trademarked program for Dance to Learn. But Dance Me A Story is every week we read a different book. So it starts with Dr. Seuss because Dr. Seuss's birthday is in March. So we'll read Cat in the Hat or Horton Hears the Who or Yertle the Turtle or whoever. We'll pick a Dr. Seuss story and we'll dance that story out. Um, we'll also read a Flory Flamingo book, which if you don't know what Flory Flamingo is, it's a ballet character that my mom and I created to help kids uh, learn their ballet terminology. And so she started off with ballet flashcards and now she's progressed into three books and we want to create more flashcards. We have a character named Oscar Ostrich, so we want to get him in there for the boys um, and do some stories with him as well. So she's sort of a fun character, but we'll read some of her stories during that month 
and then any other fun like Rosie Ballerina. There's so many ballerina books that we can read or even non-ballet books that, that we include that month. Um, April, for April we move on to April Showers Make Rainbows. And this is a really fun one. It's all about thunderstorms. So they learn about raindrops and lightning and clouds and rainbows. And it's a really fun one. And this is sort of leading up to our May flower. And so May is May I Dance in the Garden. So that starts with how do we plant a garden and dancing out that process. And then we get into animals that we might see in the garden, things like that. So that's a fun theme. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, June. So our program ends in May since we're an after school program. And then because we just follow the school district schedule. So then June and July, we get into um, summer camps, but we still teach a couple classes like we have classes at the rec center that go through the summer. So June and July, um, we're either doing camps or if we're not doing camps, then we move into some summer summer themes. And so June is under the sea, and that's exactly what it sounds like. We explore fish, and maybe we do mermaids um, or whatever, so under the sea themed. And J July tends to be a free month, so I take it off of the kids. What are, what are the kids, you know, in that group? I've done, I've done a specific mermaid month. I've done um, prince and princess. I've done, <laughs> I've done a lot of stuff, but... That's sort of a free month where I just kind of, I take it off the kids. I've done unicorns, so a whole bunch of different themes uh, for, for July. Um, August is our ABCs of Dance. We start some schools end of August, um, but most of our schools we don't start until September. But if we do have classes still going by the time August rolls around, we do ABCs of Dance. And that's a whole month devoted to Flory Flamingo. So we read her book, Flory Flamingo's ABCs of Dance, and then we also utilize the flashcard. And it just explores space concepts, so self-space, general space, and then locomotor and non-locomotor concepts, as well as learning their terminology that they're gonna hear throughout the entire session. So that's what we start our fall, August, I would consider our fall session. Um, September is back to school, back to dance. So I do a couple different things for that one. Again, I take it off who's in my class, but we might read, if it's a girl heavy class, we'll read Flory Flamingo's first ballet class. Um, she does meet Oscar Ostrich in that book, so I sort of feel like it's good to incorporate for the boys as well if you have boys in your class because Oscar Ostrich is the boy character that we created uh, for that book series. Um, but I'll also do sort of like wheels on the bus or packing up our lunch boxes for school or whatever and you know we'll dance out those processes so it could, I take it a little more literally uh, sometimes especially for like a teddy bear hip-hop class like you know if maybe we'll learn how to we'll do different things like we're driving the bus down different pathways or whatever so kind of depends on the style and who's in the class really. Um, October, I'm really gonna be talking a lot about October today as we kind of get more into this uh, Facebook Live, um, but October is fall in love with dance. Fall is one of my favorite seasons, so I, I think it's, I have a lot of favorite themes. In fact, I think I love all of my themes, but fall is one of my favorites, so fall in love with dance. And then November is really the only one that, I wouldn't really say it's holiday based, but it is inspired by Thanksgiving. So our November is dance giving. And it's a lot of, we do, one of my favorite weekly activities that we do is we dance out the process of making a pumpkin pie. And it's just such a fun month. And we talk about what we're thankful for and how we can dance and incorporate that through movement. Um, and then our last theme is waltzing in a winter wonderland. And that's our, a lot of uh, how to build a snowman, let's go sledding, let's go ice skating, that type of stuff. Stuff you would do in the winter time when it's cold outside. Snowball fights, all that stuff. 
So that's kind of a quick look at our 12 monthly themes. Um, and I think having a theme really helps me because the next component of our curriculum, once we have our theme, now we get to start picking our concepts. So I'm just gonna take a quick water break because I'm gonna be talking a lot here today. So concepts, this is really, um, this is breaking the curriculum down even further and this is our weekly schedule. So our themes is what we're gonna be teaching fall in love with dance for the entire month of October. All fall themed stuff. So, and every week I try to come up with a different element within that theme. So for example, for fall, one thing I think of right away when I think of fall is squirrels. I don't know why, I mean, we have squirrels right now, they're out there like crazy and it's summertime, but for some reason when I think fall, I think little bushy tails and squirrels and running around and eating their acorns and they're really super cute. So week one is probably gonna be something about squirrels or other fall animals um, that we might see outside, owls. I've done owls before as well. Um, I also think of scarecrows when I think of fall. Um, I know for me personally, when I get out my fall decorations, like everything is some type of scarecrow. Uh, so I definitely associate scarecrows with fall. And then of course, pumpkins. Um, you know, Halloween, we don't, again, we don't do Halloween like themed. We're not gonna do monsters and ghosts and ghouls and goblins, but pumpkins, you know, I definitely think of like going to the pumpkin patch, things like that when I think of fall. So uh, once I kind of have those sub themes, then I can sort of think what are some concepts that would go along with those sub themes. And in our program, we study 14 concepts throughout our dance year. Um, and so those concepts are space. So self space, general space, and we also include locomotor, non-locomotor concepts. Um, tempo is obviously how fast or slow we're moving. Levels, are we low, medium or high? Um, sizes, big and little. Uh, pathways, you know, are we traveling straight? Are we traveling curvy? Are we zigzagging? Maybe traveling in a circle. Um, and then directions. Uh, we study stage directions like center stage, up stage, down stage, stage right, stage left. We also study um, forwards, backwards, diagonal. So those types of directions. Uh, positional concepts. So for me, positional concepts are um, on, off, under, over, um, through, maybe we're traveling through a tunnel. Uh, so those are some positional concepts that we'll learn. Um, body shapes. So these are like, we're straight, maybe we're curvy, maybe we're like angular or making shapes. Um, maybe we're like twisted. So body, body shapes and then anatomy, head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Uh, weight. Can we dance light? Can we dance heavy? Um, energy. So maybe we're dancing really sharp. Maybe we're dancing really fluid, stuff like that. Maybe we get into a little bit of emotions when we study energy as well, dancing happy, dancing sad. Um, relationships. So my relationships are dancing with partners and other people in and through space. So maybe we're facing each other, holding hands. Maybe we're side by side holding one hand. Maybe we're back to back. Um, maybe we're following the leader. So there's different relationships that we can explore. Um, we learn sequencing. So this, the pumpkin pie example, um, you know, they'll, we'll start, you know, maybe exercises where we're rolling out the dough and then maybe we're adding in our ingredients and maybe we're picking our pumpkins or whatever. And we kind of go through the process of making that pumpkin pie. So they're sort of learning a sequence. And I feel this is really, really important to get them ready for learning choreography because learning choreography is also a sequence of steps to either tell a story or to do the dance or whatever it is you're trying to accomplish with that choreography. So sequencing is really important. 
And then patterns sort of goes with the sequencing, so we might do a lot of things where maybe we have different images like our flashcards, you know, and then we put them in a pattern and then we use those flashcards to sort of choreograph a dance, you know, what can we do that pattern repeatedly, maybe we switch the pattern up, um, maybe we get into some math stuff, like if we did this 10 times, what would the third dance move be or whatever. <laughs> um, so, and that's sort of once they get patterns, we really get into, once they get into like a pre-ballet level, we wouldn't really focus a whole lot of, on that in our creative dance class. Um, but those are the 14 patterns that, or concepts, sorry, 14 concepts that our preschoolers will learn throughout a 12 month um, dance to learn creative dance class. And a lot of times we combine um, these concepts too, like you could easily teach pathways and directions. And so a lot of times they might get, you know, through these concepts in six months. Um, and then when they hear them again, it's sort of just a review. So now that I kind of know what my concepts are and thinking about fall in love with dance and my sub themes, now I can sort of start applying, okay, how can I apply maybe a squirrel sub theme to some of these concepts? So when I'm looking at my concepts, I'm thinking squirrels, you know, they're always in trees. So maybe we're doing pathways, maybe we are doing directions. Um, so that would be one thing. Maybe tempo, like maybe we could be really super fast squirrels or maybe like super, maybe sluggish, sleepy squirrels and we're moving sort of slow. Um, my scarecrows, obviously when I think of scarecrows, like lots of body shapes. We can play, you know, with body shapes. We could even play with weights. Um, you know, maybe we're really, you know, light, silly scarecrows or like really like heavy scarecrows, stuff like that. Um, pumpkin patch. I can think of like different sized pumpkins. We could do, let's pick a small pumpkin, a medium pumpkin, and a big pumpkin from our pumpkin patch. Um, maybe again, pathways, maybe we're sneaking through the pumpkin patch. Uh, we could teach a sequence so we could, you know, grow a pumpkin patch and it starts from planting the seeds and then, you know, the vines start to grow and then the pumpkin starts to grow and we're moving through that sequence of events. Um, so I'll show you a couple examples. So, uh, for like our squirrel, I would definitely do a pathway. So I don't know if you guys can see that. So we learn uh, three primary pathways. So we learn straight, zigzag, and weaving through something. And then the last one is like a circular or curvy pattern. So moving in a circle. And so what I would do, you know, to teach these types of concepts is, um, well, you know what, let me go through all that. Let me show you my other one too. So Scarecrows and my mom, she's a artist. So she drew uh, the Scarecrow guy for me. So she helps me make some of my class visuals, but we can talk about standing, having a straight body, having a more curvy. So maybe we're falling off or we're stretching forward. Um, angular and geometric. I use my scarecrow a lot in my teddy bear hip hop class. He works really well for hip hop. I also use them in my, you know, ballet classes too, because we can do like, when I think of twisting, I think of, you know, turning, maybe doing a PK turn or something like that. So we have like our twisted shape. So um, those are just some examples of um, some concepts and visual aids that maybe we would throw in. Uh, during our during our classes. So once I kind of have my sub theme and I know what concept is going to go really well with that sub theme, then it's really time to think about my daily class flow. And this is where we get into what are the activities that we're going to teach, how are we going to teach those activities, and things like that. So, and this is really, you know, getting into the creating of your lesson plans and what you're teaching every week. So in my program, I always start us in a learning circle. 
Um, I like circles. I don't like teaching in staggered lines. I feel like that creates a real big separation. And one of my biggest pet peeves is when dance teachers teach through the mirror. I, it just drives me crazy. I would much rather have dance teachers turn around and actually look at their students than teach talking into the mirror. I don't know why, it just really bugs me. It would be like me turning around and doing this entire Facebook Live with my back turned to you. So just one of the things that I personally am not a fan of. So I like teaching in a circle. I feel like it's all inclusive, especially for this age group. When they're a little older, I don't mind the lines so much, but when they're this little, I want them to feel like they are a part of a group and a part of a class and I want them all to have equal access to me um, so they can all see me, I can inter interact and engage with all of them equally and I feel like a circle really does that. So we start our class in our learning circle, sitting down, they all have their little spots um, that they sit on and I introduce the concepts. So that's when you know I might have you know, my visual aid and maybe it's sitting in a hula hoop or something and then we're talking about you know who is that oh that's a squirrel and i'll have our class name the squirrel um he's had some doozies of names um but and then we help mr squirrel get to his tree and that's kind of how and they they'll all take a turn tracing with their finger their pathway right now with um all of the safety concerns with the virus and everything, they would probably all have their own copy of, sorry, somebody called me. Um, but they would probably all have their own copies, which will probably get a little cost consuming, but this is really important, or it's something where I can hold up and we can talk about it. And you know, I'm the only one that touches the visuals, but in, a, in an ideal world, <laughs> originally, Without virus and health concerns, that's how we would do it. We'd sit and everybody would get a turn tracing um, the little picture. So, and that we call introducing the concept in our program and we always do that in our learning circle. Um, after that, we do a warm up, and I really try to incorporate brain dance warm ups. Um, if you don't know what brain dance is, it covers like 12 different things like breath, head and tail. It's just a whole other, I did not create brain dance, um, but I'll, I'll try to find the website and I'll link it for you guys. But let's say for example, you know, squirrel theme, um, maybe we're little squirrels and we'll sit crisscross applesauce and we're gonna run up our tree, you know, straight and then we're gonna run down the tree and now this time we're gonna run up the tree in a zigzag, reaching all the way up and maybe running all the way down and that kind of gets our upper lower, our head, our tail, stuff like that. Um, I would maybe move out to tactile and maybe catching our squirrel. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see my feet, but uh, here's our squirrel. Maybe our feet are flexed and the squirrel runs in and we tickle our toes and we catch them. And then I'll ask, you know, what do you wanna feed your squirrel? And maybe we'll do some pat, tactile. Um, and then let's pet our squirrel and we'll do more rubbing of a tactile uh, feel. And then we let the squirrel go and he runs away. Uh, so that would be an example of a tactile. And there's a whole bunch of them. And that, again, it's a whole other training, but that's sort of how we would start our warm ups. And my warm ups for this age are always sitting. We always do sitting warm ups and we'll do just the general butterfly stretch point and flex, hamstring, um, straddle stretches, you know, maybe we'll do like a cat and cow type of a thing. So it just kind of depends on what our, what our concept is and what our theme is. And that's kind of how our warmups are determined. Um, so after warmups, this is when we stand up for the first time, we're still in our learner's circle. And this is when I talked about this a little bit earlier, but this is when we start the mimicking. Um, and we do the exploring the concept and this is our first standing warm-up and I'm not going to stand up today But I can kind of talk you through what that would look like. Let's say for example our squirrels here um, Maybe we would all be Squirrels and we're gonna start at the bottom of the tree So we're gonna do like a big combray stretch forward and we're just gonna 
tickle our toes and maybe pick up an acorn and we're gonna carry the acorn all the way up to the top of the tree and then maybe do some plies. And we're, we're practicing straight because we're going straight down and up. Um, after that, I have some really fun props that I found at Dollar Tree. I think props are really important to incorporate just for sensory learning for this age group. They're still very much into sensory and tactile learning development, so props are super important. If you're not using props, I would consider, I would ask that you consider changing that because um, they do, they just provide really great visuals. But I found these big acorns. They're literally this big. I would put them on the floor, and after that, we would all sort of beret walk, tiptoe walk, whatever you want to call it, in a zigzag following Miss Jessica through all of our acorns on the floor and sort of practicing our zigzag shape. And then the last thing we would do, we would all start next to an acorn and we would practice our chassés like we're flying squirrels and we'd chassé in a circle. And so that's sort of what that exploring the concept would look like using the squirrel example and um, the, uh, the uh, oh my gosh, the concept of pathways. <laughs> um, so after standing warm-ups, this is when we start, we transition. So now we're no longer in our learning circle. We're gonna transition to moving across the floor. And this is really more one-on-one -on -one or small group dancing. So before everything else was a big group, we're in our learner circle, we're doing everything together. And now it's more individual and I can really focus on the kids one-on-one. -on -one. And so the first thing that we do is sort of move across the floor practicing developing skills. Um, and so really the goal of our developing skills is to practice the movements that's going to go into our story dance pathway, which will be the next part of class. So this is all prop based for, for me and my program. So this is... This is to me like the bread and butter of my program. We do this in every class and this is what our brand is. So when parents see this in other classes, they just recognize that this is us and this is our program. So for this squirrel guy, I would, I'm gonna start building a tree for my class. So what I'm gonna do first is I might take two jump ropes and I'm gonna lay them on the floor like this parallel so that they have some place to travel through those jump ropes. So, and we're gonna start at the bottom of our tree and we're gonna be a little squirrel and we're gonna chasse up the tree. And that, those two jump ropes are the trunk of the tree. So they're learning about the different parts of the tree as we're doing this. So tree trunk, first thing we practice across the floor is our chasse. Everybody practices chasse. And then we move on to the next part of this obstacle course or this story that we're telling. So then the next part of the tree is gonna be, you know, in the branches. So I have, like I have my big acorns, I have my big leaves and I'll put my leaves down in a path. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna, you know, um, carry our acorn over our head and we're gonna bray walk in a zigzag through those leaves up the tree. So everybody practices their beret walks um, and I'm looking to make sure they're up high on their releves, on their tiptoes. So this is really where I'm looking more at technique type stuff um, because I'm really giving them their more one-on-one -on -one attention at this point. Um, then at the very top of the tree, maybe this is their nest. So I'll put in a hula hoop and um, you know, theoretically they're all holding their acorns or whatever as they're doing this. They'll chasse around the nest at the top of the tree in a circle. So they get their circular pathway and then they'll drop off their acorn and maybe they'll do like a PK 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 turn or twirl on one leg and they'll drop their acorn into the little hula hoop and then, and then that's the end and they all practice that chasse, PK 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 turn and then they drop that into uh, the hula hoop. So they all get a chance to do that one at a time. Once that's done, my tree will stay there. So jump rope, branches are the leaves, hula hoop is the nest. Then we'll do the whole thing and we'll, you know, we have, we'll have memorized it. So then we can sequence and put together all of those moves. And this is why the props are important because visually it reminds them what comes next. 
because um, if I tried to teach them this whole pattern without the help of these jump ropes and leaves and hula hoop, they're going to have a harder time remembering what comes next in the pattern or in that sequence. And so we call that, it's an obstacle course, obviously, but in our program, and this is the trademark of our program, is the story dance pathway. And so any obstacle course we do, it's not just moving through a bunch of obstacles that, you know, just to learn a concept, we actually are learning the concepts through this theme or this story that we're trying to tell. So we call that the story dance pathway. And every scarecrow, he's gonna have a different story dance pathway. Pumpkin patch, different story dance pathway. So everything, these are really copyrighted, um, trademarked to our program. And it's really when the kids start learning basics of choreography, because this is gonna be important when they do because choreography, they're gonna have to do, they're gonna have to know how to remember all of those steps in that sequence, but they're not gonna have the props to help them. So um, this really sets them up for that. So after that story dance pathway, we move on to the creating part of class. And this is the last part of class. And creating is either like teacher led, so which would be like a choreography, like we always do a showcase. So we'll start learning choreography for our May showcase, maybe in March. And uh, for our winter showcase, maybe in like end of October, early November. So um, that's when we'll start learning choreography. But until that point, it's more of a student uh, creation. So more of like an improv or a free dance part of class. Um, so how I would teach that, going back to our squirrels and our pathways, um, this isn't like, freeze dance where you just play music and they dance and they freeze. Um, it's more of a guided exploration and really we can tell at this point of class how much have they actually grasped and learned um, from everything else we've done today. So they, the direction I would give them, okay, we're going to be squirrels and uh, what I'm going to do is I am, maybe I put um, for a straight pathway, I just say, okay, I just want to see everybody move in, you know, a straight pathway around the room. And then when the music stops, I want you to find an acorn. Maybe I put different acorns down and I want you to do a, you know, hold your acorn up into a passe or something. Um, and that's sort of their freeze. And then the next one, okay, we have the acorns on the floor. This time I want you to dance around the acorns in a zigzag pattern. When the music stops, this time I want you to show me an arabesque or whatever. So it's a freeze dance, but it's more of a guided experience rather than just let's play music and freeze. Um, so it's sort of going over, it's their last chance to go over the concepts that they learned. Um, and then at the very end of class, they get their reward or their sticker. If I have time, I don't always have time depending on how big my class is, but if I have a smaller class, um, we'll do a little hula hoop time. So we'll come back to our learner's circle and I'll put a hula hoop and I just call it the dancer in the middle and I'll say someone's name and they'll have to go stand in the middle of the hula hoop and they'll show me their favorite dance move that they learned that day. Um, and then they'll get their sticker or their card or whatever it is that that particular class is earning for doing a good job. And that's how um, our class flow is for every, every creative dance class that we do. Um, so that's what that looks like. So if you guys have any questions about the process or if you'd like anything, like to know anything else that I can clarify for you, let me know in the comments um, and I'll try to read the comments and if you come back and you sort of watch this later and you comment I have an intention of answering all of your comments or if I see a question repeated you know I will just do a blanket response to everyone so dance to learn we do we are a program that I sell our lesson plans I sell our curriculum and I sell dance teacher certifications and so I'm just throwing this out here for you. If you don't feel like you have either enough time or enough knowledge or 
you would just like to have a preschool program that's already made and built and put together for you. I am starting a, it's a 14 week uh, teacher certification. It's only for creative dance. Um, and it's gonna be offered right now. It's gonna be offered, uh, it'll be a Zoom. So Fridays, we'll do a live Zoom, which will be recorded. So obviously if you can't make the live time, you can go back and watch it on your own time. And it'll be um, 12 Fridays, so 12 weeks of learning. And it'll cover everything. I'll, I can give you the schedule. And I'm, this is gonna start the week of August 14th would be the first week. And that week is just gonna be a welcome, an introduction to the course. We'll go over what is creative dance, who do you offer it to, maybe how you market it to your studio, stuff like that. Um, the following week, we're going to get into that art of teaching the ages, and that's childhood development. And we're really going to focus on ages three to five and what you need to know about that age group to be a successful teacher. Um, after that, we're going to get into our pillars of education. I did not talk about this today, but we basically follow five pillars of education, and that's based on childhood development. So we will talk about that, and that's really our methodology. Um, then for the next two weeks, we're gonna really talk about the, those 12 themes and the different sub-themes that would be included into those themes. So today, I kinda just got into fall in love with dance. In the certification, you'll sort of get the breakdown for all 12 themes plus the sub-themes that can go into those. Um, the following two weeks, so September 18th and September 25th, we're gonna get into the 14 concepts and really what are those concepts, how do we teach them, different examples of teaching those concepts and that's spread over two weeks. Um, then the next three weeks um, from August 2nd, August 9th, I'm sorry, this is October, October 2nd, October 9th and October 16th, we're getting into the class flow and we're gonna really break down and look at all the different parts of class um, and then the final two weeks is classroom management. So we'll go over routines, transitions, and then the second week we'll go over inspiring active learning or active listening and inspiring your class to listen. And then the last two weeks is an applied practicum. And what that means is that's your chance to actually apply these skills, um, but we'll watch you teach a live class, whether it be via Zoom or however we need to figure that out. Um, but that'll be over the course of two weeks and you'll have a chance to market, you know, the class throughout the course to get kids signed up. So by the time that applied practicum comes along, uh, you have, um, you have kids <laughs> to teach for your class. Cause we want to, obviously a big part of it is watching, watching you teach and making sure that you have appropriate classroom management skills and things like that because that's really, really important for the preschool aged uh, preschool aged kiddos. So, sorry if I'm not seeing questions being posted. Um, I did have a couple questions prior to that I'm gonna get into, um, but I am, I'm gonna share the link to the certification. So what we're doing right now is these are limited so it's a Zoom and Facebook. So basically what'll happen is that schedule that I just shared, we'll do a Zoom, um, like a lecture or a group talk, group class with all of the participants and those will be recorded and then shared into a private Facebook group for all of our participants. And if somebody didn't, didn't have Facebook or whatever, we'll have a Google Drive. Like it'll be accessible through many different means um, and then in the Facebook group or the Google Drive that's where we're going to share weekly assignments that you do which will just uh, sort of make sure that you're understanding the content and the material and they won't be anything like too crazy but it'll be maybe for example um, the week that we're going over class flow your challenge will be you know um, share your idea of a fall in love with dance, um, brain dance warm up or something. And so that'll be your weekly activity. So, um, and that'll continue through the 12 weeks. 
but we are limiting enrollment. We only open our certifications up to 10 instructors at a time because we want it to be small, personable, one-on-one, uh, -on -one. and you know, if you need extra help or whatever, we, I want to be there for you. So there's, it's only open to 10 right now, and the first five slots we're offering at, mo at more than 50% off. So it's a pretty big discount. The normal price for our creative dance teacher certification is $1,200. Right now, the first five people to register can get in for $500. Um, after that first five, everyone after that, it's gonna be the $1,200 again. So I'm gonna share the link to that in the comments here. So if you're interested in signing up for that certification, head on over there. It does not start until August, the week of August 14th. So you have time to sign up for that um, because we're still, we're still in July. So it won't start for a couple weeks. Um, but first five people get that nice discount. After that, it will go up to the regular price of 1200. Um, so let me know if you have questions about the certification. Uh, I'm gonna get into the questions. I had two questions that were sort of repeated questions that I wanna um, get into. The first one was about, um, and I know I touched on this during the presentation today, but one of the questions that I had was, how do you keep your kids focused? And this is a how question, so this isn't content based or anything like that. This is one of those how questions, but how do you keep your kids focused when you're trying to, you know, maybe explain something or demonstrate or, you know, choreograph and the music isn't playing and you want them to focus on you. And this is where um, understanding that kids at this age love mimicking. And I always turn that stuff into a game of copycat. And I explain to them before we do it. I, you know, if it's exploring the concept, um, that's one time. And then again, choreography is another time where they're going to be. Um, the only time I demonstrate is during that obstacle course. Um, and I try to keep it super short <laughs> so that they can just do the obstacle course and be, you know, on to the next thing. Um, Cause that's the key is to kind of keep it all moving. But during those other parts, exploring the concept, choreography, I literally just play the music <laughs> And I say, okay, we're gonna copy me. We're gonna be little squirrels and we're gonna climb up the tree and we're gonna climb down the tree and we're gonna get our acorn and we're gonna spin around and we're gonna put our acorn down. And now we're all gonna tiptoe walk through the acorns. And I literally, they just copy me, do what I'm doing. I don't take any time to explain anything extra um, to them because I probably will lose their focus and it just takes time out of class. So I just get to it, just get right down to it. Um, sorry, Instagram. All right, you guys are still there. Um, so mimicking, copying, and I, and I ask them, I say, okay, who are we copying right now? Because sometimes they might get confused. They might say, you know, oh, look at little Sally over there. She's twirling and falling down. And then I want to twirl and fall down too. So I'll take a moment to say, who are we copying? Are we copying Miss Jessica? Or are we copying little Sally over here? And I think we're copying you, Miss Jessica. So I kind of have to remind them a little bit, who are we copying? Um, especially at the end, choreography, they're getting a little antsy by that point. It's 45 minute class. They're getting ready to go. They just want their stickers. Um, I also use stickers as motivation. I say I need everyone to copy Miss Jessica right now because this is how we earn our stickers. And like 95% of my kids get it. They do fine and we don't have uh, we don't have problems. They might take a little bit of coaxing and reminding every now and again, but for the most part, they're good. Um, the other question that I had a lot, and I know that this is a big question right now because of social distancing and germs and all of that stuff, but how do we convince <laughs> three-year-olds to stay social distanced? And I'll be really honest with you guys, I have only taught one in-person in class since this whole thing happened. Everything else has been virtual. Um, but I did just last week, I believe, or the week before, I taught a five-day summer camp. The kids were a little bit older. I had one three-year-old and then the rest were five and six, and it was a small group. There were only four, four girls um, signed up. 
But what I did was I went to the Dollar Tree and they always sell their little baskets and I just bought five little baskets. One basket was for me and all the girls got their own basket. And in their basket was everything they were gonna need for that week. So uh, we did a craft. So whatever their daily craft was, went in their own basket. They had their coloring pages, all went in their own basket. Crayons, whatever they needed, went in their own basket. And I just sort of spread the baskets out around the room and their names were on them. And so we'd come in, they'd set their stuff down by their basket, you know, everything that they needed was just right there. Um, I, didn't, I didn't worry too much about like taping the floor, like I did tape, but I didn't go crazy. I didn't do squares or anything because I share the space with other people. Um, and the rec center did not want <laughs> tape on the floor. So uh, all I did for that was I put down one little piece of tape and then a line maybe about, you know, four feet. And the little piece of tape was where they stood and did all their dancing. And then if we kind of started moving, that longer piece of tape was just sort of, don't cross that line. Um, so that's sort of how I divided them um, into their space. And I would say this was successful. Like we did not cross contaminate anything. Anything that was in my basket was stuff that only I was touching. Let's say if I was putting props down for an obstacle course or whatever, I touched it, sanitized it, whatever. Put it away so there was stuff that just I touched and that was in my own basket um, the only one who had a hard time with that was the three-year-old because every time I'd put an obstacle course down she'd just want to go help pick everything up um, but again if she touched it I didn't want to make a big deal out of it I just I had my core I stocked up on Clorox wipes so I had my Clorox wipes just you know disinfected everything um, I would say the biggest thing for this age group, I was really honest with my parents. <laughs> um, you know, I was sort of like, I'm really excited to teach camp. I want everybody to be safe, number one, but I also want everyone to have fun. And so I kind of told them my plan to help us stay as social distanced as possible. Uh, but I also told them there's going to be times during, this is a three hour camp. There's going to be times where they're going to want to be kids. And it usually was when we took a break for snack in our craft. That's when they kind of wanted to start getting, you know, a little bit close. They wanted to talk because we weren't really doing a group led thing. It was more individualized, eating snacks, stuff like that. So I just told parents, if we do get close, I have hand sanitizer and they all have to bring a mask. They don't have to wear it the whole time because none of them hit the age requirements. Our state, you have to be 10 and up to wear a mask. But um, I said, if they get close, we're all gonna put our masks on, hand sanitize. And that's just kind of what we did. And I would say 90% of the time we were successfully social distanced and it was just during that short little snack break. Um, you could probably do snack and stuff outside and take some outside breaks and things like that too. We didn't really have that option um, because again, it's a shared space. So everything kind of has to get approved for, through the rec center. But that's kind of how I tackled the social distancing stuff. Um, and we'll have to see. Obviously, some of my pro program things might have to change during the school year if all of this continues into um, the school year. But those were really two of the biggest questions that I had was more so for like focus. How do I can keep them focused? and then social distancing right now is like the big one. So I would just have a plan and be honest with your parents and say, I'm gonna do my best, recognize that these are kids. If we can't social distance, this is the plan I have in place. You know, if they start getting close, I'm just gonna ask that they put a mask on um, and we're gonna sanitize and do all of that. Anytime we went to the bathroom, we came back, we washed our hands and hand sanitizer. So we kind of did all of that. So it's just really, just be upfront with your parents um, and let them know how you're planning on running your, your classes so that they're aware as well. Um, cool, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. I If you watch this later uh, and have a question, just add it in the comments. I will see it and I will try to respond to you as quickly as I can. 
But I want to thank everyone who joined me today. And again, if you watch later, don't forget to let me know who you are and where you're watching from so I can go follow you and your studio. And I just love connecting with other dance teachers and studios out there. So thank you so much, Facebook. Thank you so much, Instagram. This will be posted on YouTube as well. So check it out there if you missed it. Bye everyone. My name is Jessica Strong and I'm the director and owner here at Dance to Learn. And thank you.